On immigration, Joe Biden has shown that he's working quickly to undo Donald Trump's cruel and xenophobic legacy, but the United States immigration system was broken long before Trump. So what's it gonna take to create a more just and humane policy? What will activists be pushing Joe Biden to do in the next four years? How can we help? Jose Luis Granado Ceja is here with me to discuss. Mr. Ceja is a freelance journalist and writer, a photojournalist based in Mexico City. His stories focus on contemporary political issues, particularly those that involve grassroots efforts to affect social change. He often covers the work of social and labor movements in Latin America. Welcome, Jose, to the program. Talk about the damage the Trump administration and those before him left President Biden and what Biden's administration has done thus far to reverse our Im uh, racist immigration legacy. As we saw in the early days of the Biden administration, one of the first acts was signing a series of executive orders that took a look at the Trump era immigration policies and, you know, attempted to provide some measure of protection for uh, DACA, uh, try to end the uh, certain types of uh, deportations, a 100-day moratorium, a review of the migrant protection protocols, better known as Remain in Mexico. But I think the Biden administration is finding out that a lot of the changes that were made by the Trump era officials are actually deeply ingrained. And so they're finding that, you know, Texas challenged the moratorium on deportations and they weren't able to, to proceed after a judge conceded that order. And so there is a lot to dismantle. But I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of the issues inside of the immigration system didn't start with Trump. Sure, they were exacerbated, but a lot of the changes that actually happened during the Clinton years and the Obama years, Obama was famously known as the porter in chief for the mass enforcement and deportations that happened during his administration. Uh, so that this idea that it is exclusively a Republican problem, I think needs to be challenged, that the changes uh, that need to be made also go back to this previous era of other of that that sought to make it difficult. Uh, but truly the Trump era policies were among the worst. You know, the, the, there was this phrase that we heard a lot during the, the, the Trump administration, which was that the cruelty is the point, making it so difficult for people to, to be able to access the immigration system that they would give up even to bothering to try. I think that was the logic behind the protection point. protocols so that it, that people would relent from trying to reach the United States. But the truth is it's too difficult. Did that, work? I mean, were people in, say, Guatemala paying attention to what was going in the U.S. when they had to grab their kids and leave under the cover of night to escape violence? I mean, that's just it. I think people need to understand that when people choose to take this incredibly dangerous journey, and we're talking about exposing themselves to difficult conditions in terms of walking under the sun, exposure to potential acts of violence, exposure to organized crime, having to pay the smugglers who are also tied to organized crime. It's incredibly dangerous. People don't engage in that kind of risk if they aren't fleeing something that's much worse. The situations in countries like Honduras and Guatemala are so critically bad that people feel like they have no other choice. And so you can put up all the barriers in the world. You can create a wall of riot police. People will continue to go. But I will say one thing that uh, migrant activists have been calling on is also a change of attitude to these caravans. These caravans that we see, sometimes called the Central American Exodus, is a protection mechanism. If people don't travel in these large groups, they are forced to travel in smaller groups. And not that long ago, we saw actually uh, a massacre of Guatemalan migrants in the Mexican state of Tamaulipas because they were traveling in these isolated small groups they are much more vulnerable. And so one thing that the Bartolo Fuentes from Honduras said is that stop demonizing, stop criminalizing these caravans. These people are choosing to use this method because it provides you know, some measure of safety. At least you know they can take care of each other. If they're able to get some food, they're able to share it amongst themselves. And so that I think is also an important demand being made by migrant justice activists in Central America. But there's already some moves to try to change that in the sense that what they want to do is make it so uh, ankle bracelets are used instead of uh, the detainment of migrants, but also expanding the capacity. So there's backlogs that take years to get through. That means that people should be able to arrive to the United States, 
present their case and receive a hearing in a, in a promptly amount of time and be able to wait with family members, with, uh, with organizations that support migrants inside the United States as their date approaches. I think that's the, 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 the most immediate things. Uh, and I think also making it uh, more open to different types of immigration. You know, more family re re reunification, more visas for workers. I mean, when people are fleeing, what they're seeking is opportunity. You know, they're, they're seeking is a, is a chance to be able to send money back home or be able to save some money and then head back and then try to build a, a home for themselves in their countries of origin. And so making it easier for people to work. The U.S. economy depends on migrant labor, so they should facilitate it as opposed to in a sense, allowing irregular migration, which allows employers to pay under the table and not provide social security, not provide you know, uh, the, the legal minimum wage and things like that. You've said before that um, Democ democratic administrations have been equally um, complicit in the inhumane system that we have, not as much as Trump, but, but, but equally complicit. Can you talk about, and, and you've also said that, 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 the voters, the voting population tend to vote, you know, that, that Democrats say, oh, well, we, we have to be hard on this because otherwise the Trump base or these white supremacy people are, are, are going to have our hides. Uh, it won't be political, politically feasible, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that, what you're seeing there? And also, how do you explain that so many, you know, immigrants who are able to vote in this country actually voted for Trump. Well, when I saw the numbers, I thought, yeah, I think when in terms of this fear that many Democratic Party officials seem to have about pr producing a backlash uh, is is not founded in the realities. These people, the people who appeals to xenophobia, appeals to racism, the white supremacists are never going to change their tune. Instead, what I think people need to do is start to become more vocal in support of a more humane immigration policy, of a humane policy, of an immigration policy that is open to welcoming with open arms migrants who are fleeing danger, who are fleeing poverty, who are fleeing some of the repercussions of US policy in the region. And if they're able to become more vocal, then, then these same Democratic Party officials will have more confidence of pursuing these. They won't fear these groups. As for why you saw border communities in Texas, for example, voting for Donald Trump, uh, there was an interesting uh, essay in The Nation where people went and talked and they struggled to find an answer themselves. But I think also that in that case, what we saw was that people who work in the oil and gas industry, you know, they were told if Biden wins, they're going to shut down the, you know, your workplace and you're not going to be able to. And that that anxiety about their future uh, serve to really motivate them in terms of, well, I have to protect what I have. You know, it, it, it cost me a lot to get to where I am. And so even though I don't like that he calls, you know, my compatriots rapists and murderers, you know, with him, my job is secure. And so uh, I think that the messaging for these communities is also one that, that the script needs to change, right? Uh, when we talk about the the Latin American community in the United States, it's often always about immigration, but there are other considerations. You know, does my community feel safe? Do I is there opportunities for my children? Can my children go to college? Will I be able to afford that? Will I be able to retire? These are also important working class considerations by people in these communities, and that if they're not hearing the message that they want to hear, may be seduced despite all of the negative language that comes from Republican Party. Biden pledged to address the root causes of immigration. You mentioned those a moment ago. Let's talk about the reasons for increased migration. Uh, and what do you think the Biden administration will do? I think what the Biden administration considers root causes and what migrant activists and migrant justice activists consider root causes are a little bit different. We are actually quite familiar with what Biden conceives to be the root causes and the means of addressing it because he was Obama's envoy to Central America during the previous migration crisis that saw lots of unaccompanied children arriving to the United States. And what he wants to see is development projects. And on the surface, that sounds good. But from what I've talked to from with, with people from Central America is that these kinds of projects 
don't actually trickle down to the people. And so when you're dealing with a government like Juan Orlando Hernandez in Honduras, which is you know an oligarchy, it is a country that is allegedly a narco state. When you're providing funding to that government or to business people who are tied to that government, that money is probably never going to actually make it. And, and instead, and if it does, it might pro uh, promote projects that ultimately displace indigenous communities, displace campesinos. And so there needs to be a critical look at what kinds of investments are actually happening. And then I think the other thing that migrant activists have been, have been telling me is that they need to end support for these kinds of governments like Juan Orlando and Nandes, right? It's a dictatorship. It's been a dictatorship since the coup in 2009 against Mel Zelaya. And the US support for the national party governments in Honduras has been critical for them being able to stay in power. And why but is the US supporting the regimes? Well, I think the, the United States is interested in its, in its national security interests, as it calls it. So it's willing to tolerate a figure like Juan Orlando Hernandez because he is an ally of the United States. He's a dependable ally. He's able to, you know, when they tap, tap, tap him on the shoulder in order to crack down on migration, he's going to do it. And so that consideration makes it so they're, they're willing to overlook the human rights abuses, the questionable democratic credentials of the government. And I think that's something that is also really important for people inside Honduras to feel like that there's still hope that their country can improve. If they're able to feel like, okay, this government, you know, there's elections at the end of this year, we'll finally be able to oust them, maybe our situation will improve and people won't flee. I think that's another thing that uh, people maybe fail to realize is that most people want to stay in their homes, with their families, if possible. If people are fleeing, it's because they feel like they have no other choice. What of the fact that U.S. corporations have gone down to Central America and really decimated um, areas there? Absolutely. I mean, that's when we're when we're talking about these neoliberal development projects. We're talking about these projects that don't that come in. They don't obtain free, prior, and informed consent from these affected communities. They pursue development projects that favor their interests. And then all of that wealth that is generated, you know, you, you open an, a, an open pit mine and you extract all of these resources, you know, then they sell them international market and that capital goes right back to the United States or other imperialist countries like Canada. And that never makes it to the country. So people are losing their national wealth the wealth that belongs to all of the people of these countries and getting very little in return. And that's also something that needs to be challenged because a lot of their acts are facilitated by the U.S. Embassy in Central America, by the U.S. State Department, which is interested in helping these countries, you know, improve their bottom line. But at what I, cost? I, I have yet to see any politician, but so, I, I think someone mentioned it. Maybe it was someone running in the Democratic primary. I'm not sure which candidate. Um, but I've yet to see a, a seated politician say, you know, as, as Biden said, he's going to address the root cause of migration to say, hmm, uh, maybe we have to address these corporations going down. And as you said, it's not just mining, but for lack of a it's an excellent term, mining out all the resources there and, and just displacing the people. Uh, I don't think we're going to see that in, in Biden's administration. Do you? I don't think we'll see it early on, but I do think if the pressure is applied, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of there's a growing community of Central Americans in the United States who are finding their voice, who are finding means of expressing their challenges to U.S. foreign policy. And I think as that momentum continues to grow, there will be more room for these politicians to try to uh, make policies that don't, at the very least, don't exacerbate the problem. You know, uh, there is, for example, this still discussion of the Berta Cáceres Act inside the U.S. Congress. That act looks to protect human rights defenders, land defenders in countries like Honduras and make it so that that the U.S. government can't support companies that engage in these kinds of acts that, you know, in the case of Berta Cáceres, actually led to her assassination by the people who were frustrated with her and her community and her organization's efforts to stop these kinds of projects. Which activist groups should we be paying attention to or joining as the immigration fight continues here in the U.S.? Yeah, I, I mean, you, you mentioned that there's there's organizations that are uh, on the ground that are assisting. Al Otro Lado, for example, is one that immediately comes to mind. Uh, there's a lot of organizations that are providing direct support 
to migrants, you know, they're like, do you need a lawyer? Do you need somebody to review what you're going to present to the immigration officials? But are also, you know, they're activists. They're, they're, they're always considering the political dimension of what they're doing. You know, the solution isn't just providing lawyers so that people be able to navigate the system, but rather challenging what the foundations of that system are, which is about excluding people, it's about making it difficult. And I think so organizations like that, uh, I'm really excited by the work that an organization called Migrant Roots Media is doing. And they're specifically focusing on amplifying the voices of Central Americans and doing it from that critical lens that, that those voices that you don't necessarily hear from mainstream media, you know, they published an excellent report, which took a look at what Biden's plan for Central America really means, you know, and looking at his history in the region and providing that critical voice and saying, actually, if we go down this path, not only will the situation not improve, but quite possibly we'll be entrenching the very same types of policies and economic decisions that led to the crisis in the first place. Jose Luis Granado Ceja is a freelance writer and photojournalist. You're based in Mexico. Thank you so much for being on our program. I really appreciate it. Always good to be here. You're watching ACT TV. Stay with us.